Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One, and our guest today is Peter Soroka, Managing Director and CTO of Cybus. Cybus Connectware lets you connect digital services as easily as installing apps on your smartphone and enables you to keep control of all the data that is about to leave your factory. In this talk, we discussed how improved data access and control can remove barriers to use case adoption in complex environments by enabling effective IoT governance. We also explored a future for connected industry in which data becomes a tangible asset that can be monetized through new business models. If you found these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, please email us at team at iot1.com. Thank you. Peter, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Peter, uh, we're going to be discussing primarily today uh, Cybus and the solutions that you're bringing to market for the, the smart factory. But before we jump into uh, the, the company, I want to just learn a little bit more about where you yourself are coming from and how you ended up as the, the CTO of uh, Cybus. Can you give us just a, a quick background on um, what led you to, uh, to the manager director and, and CTO role here? I myself, I am an electrical engineer originally, but also in my studies and my research work after university, I've always touched more bits and bytes than electrons, let me say that like this. So I would consider myself being a software engineer today. And I would say roughly five years ago, maybe it was five and a half, the whole IoT industry 4.0 hype started. And back then, two friends of mine and I um, decided to, to start a company in this field. And um, the, the main motivation that we, we had back then was that we were quite excited that the concepts of the internet, so interconnectivity, APIs and so on, were proposed to be extended to the real world. And we immediately understood the plethora of use cases and applications and systems that will be uh, needed to be connected across vendors. And we decided to, to take a very specific niche and to, have, to, to create a company that works on the, on the layer that's usually called the gateway layer because that's the necessary evil everybody needs, but that supposedly doesn't create any value as its own. Um, and we decided to be a company that has a core competence at the position where many others have a necessary evil and to provide a, a focused solution on this layer. Okay, great. And this, this just came up in a conversation with an investor uh, last week, <laughs> the pain she was having with her portfolio companies there. Before we jump into that, I have to take you on a quick diversion here. So I apologize for this, but I, I see that you were running a peer-to-peer -peer sharing platform for sailboats. Can you just give us a quick 60 second? What, what was this uh, company that you had set up, this uh, bootshaft.net? Very, very good. So, uh, Botschaft, that's a German play on words, actually. Today, you would uh, describe it as Airbnb for sailboats, I would say. Uh, so, we enabled uh, private sailboat owners to, to share their sailboat through an app. But we created that in 2010, and that was before Airbnb was, at least in Germany, famous uh, or well-known. And so we, we, we created everything from scratch. We programmed the whole system to connect the sailboat and the GPS systems from scratch. And today I would say what we did back then was an IoT platform for sailboat sharing. So we already had some insights into uh, the technology that was required for IoT use cases. And also we had already done a number of mistakes, I would say. Uh, technological mistakes or wrong decisions and learned a lot. And with this experience, um, basically, we decided to go on the industrial market and apply our learnings and uh, create a company from that. Okay, very interesting. So, uh, <laughs> Securitas wrote that uh, brought you to this current company. But, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> very good. So, let's then dive in uh, here. 
you've you've already alluded to the the problem that you are solving here. Can you just describe a bit the tech stack on a typical solution where Cybus would be useful and and how you fit in there? What is the the pain that you're solving in the typical tech stack? We are focused on really the industrial IoT market, and I would narrow it a bit more down to yeah, connecting assets in factories, um, stationary assets. Um, so we are it's it's really more about connecting machines to IT systems in general. And then the interesting thing is there are so many perspectives from which you can approach IoT in a factory. There's so many different stakeholders that are interested in connecting the very same machines to very different systems. So you have a you have a big data team that tries to um, connect machine data to a data lake in order to do big data analysis. You have a maintenance team that wants to do smart or uh, on-demand maintenance planning. You have a, a production manager that wants to introduce an MES system. And then you have all the clouds and then you have all the external stakeholders like the machine builders, suppliers, customers, insurances, banks. And everybody wants to connect the same machines to different target systems. And as everybody is bringing along their own gateway that more or less uncontrolled would send the data somewhere, there's an interesting playground, I would say, to introduce a layer of their distribution and to give control into the hands of the factories and in the end governance into the hands of the IT departments to um, not lose overview about which data is collected, which data is sent where, and also to avoid basically double connecting machines because um, you have two different gateways for the same machine because you have two different target systems. So that's the playground we are working on. And so our, our offering is a pure standalone, so not cloud connected or not cloud dependent, let's say it like this, a pure standalone software solution that's running on-premise in the factory and it allows a multi-tenant and multi-purpose data distribution. So you mentioned that there's many stakeholders that want access to data for for many different purposes. And then there, uh, of course, are some stakeholders who expressly don't want other stakeholders to access their data. So I think a, a number of the larger kind of legacy sensor and PLC manufacturers try to put up barriers because this helps to protect their market share. Are you relevant in that kind of that that battle to gain access to data when it's uh, it's somewhat being protected by an OEM or or is it basically this data has to be in the gateway so there has to already be let's say access to the the end device before uh, Cybus would be able to say regulate the the flow of this data. That's a super interesting point. I mean, as you know, Especially in the industry, we, we are really coming from a world where secrets, like uh, secret protocols, secret proprietary um, data encodings or so, were um, put up to, uh, to ensure some competitive advantage and so on. And this kind of contradicts the I in IIoT, right? I mean, the, the internet lives from APIs that are open and standardized and very non-secret. And that's an interesting contradiction, I would say. That's also something I observe the industry has learned along the, the last five years, that this idea that you always have to keep everything secret must be given up a little bit in order to, to gain a, a joint benefit from collaboration. Still, it's not something very simple, and, but there are some very interesting associations that have uh, been founded to solve these problems. Um, specifically, we are a member of, an inter, uh, of the International Data Spaces Association that tries to, to, to solve this problem that there's at the same time the, the demand to, to protect data and to share data uh, from different stakeholders and uh, you need to somehow create trust. And the Industrial da International Data Space Association has a very interesting reference model to solve this very problem. There's even a DINSPEC or um, just released for this, uh, which will become an ISO standard soon. But there are also other um, associations like the Open Industry 4.0 Alliance, which is also a German association of specifically sensor manufacturers that have realized after 
years of trying to, to solve individual IoT solutions that in the end, the customers have a hard time accepting incompatible solutions from their different suppliers because many factories, most factories have not only one supplier, but many. And if every supplier has their own full stack IoT solution, it just doesn't work. Yeah? So they have to collaborate. And so there are these standardization efforts. We are active in some of them in the active work groups, and we try to always keep our software solution up to date with these standardization efforts to be able to be a solution provider in these specific groups. Based on your perspective, I think you have a fairly unique perspective based on where you are in the tech stack. Where are we today in this, uh, let's say, this struggle? Are we looking at a three-year time horizon or a 10-year time horizon or a who knows when time horizon when data from the vast majority of endpoints will be standardized, maybe not to the point you know, of HTML or uh, HTTP, but standardized enough that somebody can go in with you know, an application provider, can go into a factory with a good application, and they can get access basically to the data that they need in order to uh, apply that. Because I still today, I, I talk to a lot of companies that feel like they need to build a full stack and deploy their own sensors um, in order for their solution to work. And it's, uh, I think it's a very interesting topic what the, you know, where, where we are today in terms of the status quo and what the timeline might be to, let's say, nirvana when, when we have uh, access to data. So that's a super interesting question. So I, I think we are, when I draw the history of, of IoT in the industry, then I would say for a number of years, everybody has been working on proof of concepts and pilots. <laughs> Many companies still have a hard time getting beyond that because they realize that certain questions like the one we are just discussing really just arises when you try to scale a particular project. It's it's fairly easy with today's technology, even with a Raspberry Pi and some open source software to just connect the machine to, to some cloud and do something, right? And now I think we are in the beginning of the phase where people start to realize that they really need to to to, to find some standardization. But still, I think, to be very honest, I think most associations are not on the right track for now. They try to over-standardize things. To, the standards are getting fairly big. And we had the same in the, in the classic internet. Uh, so the classic internet tried to, to find uh, very complex standardizations, uh, um, like for the tech experts from the audience, like the SOAP standard. SOAP was a technology, an interface technology, basically based on XML, which tried to be, be able to, to explain the world. Yeah? That it is super complex. It's super complete, I would say, but it's super hard and annoying to implement. And in the end, after this effort to have a very complex SOAP interface, where we ended was the REST API. And the REST API is what, you see as a standard everywhere. So it's not important if you look at PayPal or Amazon or any other project, everything has a REST API. You even start creating your REST API when you program a new software today. And the REST API is the most simple and most non-standardized thing in the world. But it's so simple that it's trivially easy to, to, to adapt to a new REST API. And I'm pretty convinced that in the industry, we will see two or three more years of trying to over-standardize everything. And then I hope that uh, we will observe that things get more pragmatic. And uh, specifically, I have a lot of trust in MQTT as a protocol, as becoming something as simple and pragmatic and straightforward and open like the REST API has become for, for the classic internet. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. I hope so. I guess this is going to be a bit of an open question right now, but uh, two to three years, that would be a very welcome timeline for, for everybody to make, make some sort of transition here. So I suppose where you are today, where Cybus is, is really providing value is not necessarily then providing access to the endpoints, but it's in a situation where this data is already moving to the gateways. You're providing value around governance, the IT efficiency of managing who has access to data? And then is it also 
being able to, let's say, optimize the use of gateways by not requiring kind of duplication for every use case that's being deployed? Would, would those three be the kind of the, the key elements of your value proposition? Or how would you frame the kind of the core elements of your value proposition when you're introducing to a new customer? Okay, so that depends on, on which type of cast customer we're talking about. So we are selling to two fundamentally different customer groups. One is the factories. So we are selling directly to, to factories, um, so operators of uh, industrial production equipment. For them, the governance problem is really the biggest one. Yeah? So we, as I said, they have dozens or hundreds of machines from different ages, from different vendors, with different maturity, I would say, to, so, uh, to di- in, in regards of digitization. So some already have an Ethernet uh, plug, uh, and you can just plug in your cable and start reading the data in a modern protocol. And many don't even have any digital interface. Uh, so really being able to, to abstract this heterogeneity and then route the data to different IT systems is really the governance problem, and it's also a scalability problem. So when it comes to how to implement standard, standardized processes uh, about how the next machine will be connected, how to extend the data that's gathered, how to pre-process the data, or where to do the pre-processing. I mean, if you look into, into the big enterprises, the biggest pain is usually called customization. ERP systems, MES systems have a very high degree of customization because you're adapting your target system for, for every new data that's arriving and every new process. We try to, to, um, to take away the customization efforts in the, on, the, on the target systems and on the machines because we believe you should never be required to change a PLC program just because you are connecting another cloud. And we try to... to to centralize this customization effort into a configuration um, effort on the middleware layer, basically. And then it's really scalability, it's customization savings, it's um, security, because when you connect to machines, you can also control machines, right? So it's very, very critical um, to, to prevent that if you don't want it and to allow it if it's required. And the second customer group now, uh, that was a long sentence, the second customer group are the suppliers, um, are the machine vendors, are the insurances that are external to the factory, but also want to bring in some infrastructure, some gateways in order to get data out. And for them, we solve a totally different problem. That's mainly acceptance. Acceptance that your customer would share their data because there's this always open question, who owns the data? (laughs) And my answer to this question is, it doesn't really matter about who owns the data, but it's very clear who has control over the network where the data comes from, and that's always the factory. So when you start creating the gateway as an external company, you usually create a black box that's even remote controlled, and that somehow does what you want. And we propose to have not a black box gateway, but to give the control about the date gate, gateway layer into the hands of your customers, but stay in control about the software and the configuration that's running there. And that's a very special, special USP of, of the Cybers Connectware because we can, we can combo- combine these two desires, the control desire of the factory, the delivery basically of the, of the supplier about the edge intelligence and the, and the configuration and so on. This is really two very different value propositions, I would say, two very different customer groups. But in the end, it will be always one installation of our software in the factory and serve both needs. Okay, very interesting. And is it more common that you'd be entering the, the, the factory initially through one or the other of these two customer groups? It's really today 50-50. So 50% of our customers are direct fast factories and 50% are suppliers. Then you have often uh, dual cases because most suppliers have their own factory as well, right? <laughs> and um, uh, we, of course, are hoping that's uh, an open secret to gain some uh, acceleration when the machine vendors and the component suppliers start rolling out at large scale. 
with our software, distributing them to factories. That's our strategy. But to be very honest, today the market is not that fast. I'd like to dive into a little bit more detail for both of these cases. If we focus first on the factory, this is actually a, a point that's let's say very relevant to me at this moment because we have a, a company that we're working with that has this this challenge. Right, they're moving to a new greenfield facility. They have some legacy use cases. They want they have some new use cases that they want to deploy. And the question is, how do we minimize the complexity and the cost of both? deploying sensors to acquire this data, deploying the connectivity infrastructure, and then also to an extent, you know, deploying specific applications. We don't necessarily even want to have a unique application uh, or let's say app for each, each application. We want to try to standardize some of this. So there's a lot of uh, complexity in this uh, situation. In this case, they prefer to have a, a, a platform that is governing the processing and the, the storage of, of data and then there's a question of what uh, what requirements do we you know, do we put into that uh, platform when we build it, uh, and those requirements would be driven by the use cases. So, if you're moving into kind of a messy situation like this, how would you view this? So, what would be your you know, your main questions or your main lines of inquiry in order to understand the, the customer and and then understand how your solution can help them to resolve some of the complexity? Okay, so my my approach on on complexity. I can answer with a very simple word that's decoupling. I try to decouple everything from everything. And in, in, the, in the classic software development, we have a notion that's called microservice architecture. Microservice architecture means we try to split a big, complex software project into individual independent modules. And these modules can be developed on their own and don't know anything about the others. And they can have an individual life cycle. And this is very efficient. It also has some challenges, to be honest. But this, it's very efficient because you can throw away modules. You can introduce new ones. You can replace individual ones. And I see the smart factory as a very big microservice architecture. So I have my data sources and I have my data sinks. And the data sources are usually the sensors and the machines and so on. and primarily. Machines should do what they should do, produce stuff. Now. So, so primarily, a, a PLC has, if you ask me, the task to, to com- control the process uh, in a real-time fashion and very efficiently. PLC should never know anything about a cloud or an MES system or so. Instead, I see then the, the protocols like OPC UA or Modbus, or it doesn't really matter, as like the API to the machine and the machine should expose the data it can provide and it might also expose some some uh, control endpoints but then that's it and the same on the other side of the table an MES system is an MES system it it has many information about processes and orders and order numbers but an MES system has no idea about big data or, or um, predictive maintenance and so on, and, or even maintenance processes. And it shouldn't have, because that's not its purpose. So it, I really believe in specialization. And then I say, okay, MES system or ERP system, you also should implement your specific interface, your API that is designed in the way you need it. And you shouldn't know anything about OPC UA or, or Modbus or at best. Yeah. I think architecture in between a middleware that connects the respective APIs with each other, and we believe in MQTT, as I just said, um, so that's a message bus architecture, can very well collect data from the one side and deliver it in the right format on the other side, and really draw the lines between the many um, elements, the many microservices. And then you are pretty efficient because you can, you can, of course, installing some such an architecture, such an infrastructure for the first use case is quite an effort. And it's a bigger effort than just connecting directly. But already the second use case will benefit largely because you just already have everything there. It allows you to, to quickly iterate, to quickly add more applications, to try something 
to let it fall again if it's not worth it to change something on the bottom or in the in the top uh, without touching the rest of the system so that's that's my approach on this complexity okay and if you're in a brownfield environment is is it any different from in a greenfield or you just start with what you have and and you just build the infrastructure as you've just described it uh, and try to uh, you know adapt the existing system and infrastructure to this ideal format the rough approach is the same but uh, of course it's it's very different uh, when it comes to the specifics because in the brownfield environment the biggest problem you usually have is that connecting a single machine usually is a research project for its own right so my my, my typical customer uh, interaction here <laughs> is uh, my favorite anecdote it's a customer coming to me say can you connect my factory i say of course which data do you need and the answer usually is everything <laughs> and then i ask why and then the customer would say uh, that's what i want to find out and when i and when i then say uh yeah okay so how old are your machines and how different are they then usually we we end up in a in an effort estimation that quickly can uh, go towards five to ten thousand euro per machine because we just have to find out everything yeah? that nobody knows anything about the interfaces and the protocols and the address space and that's usually not effective so what we do in a brownfield environment is we recommend customers to start very simple and to find common denominators between the machines and they might be much simpler than the customer expects like connecting energy centers because most machines uh, need electrical energy that could also already give you some uh, hints or my favorite is really connecting the status lights this little traffic light on the on the on the top of the machine green yellow red which is very very simple but it's just a 24 volt voltage signal that you can easily grab by connecting these things you can with a very low investment already know from all of your machines if they are currently running or if they have some some kind of error and that's not much but if you know it from 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 all the machines then it's already a lot and and i usually recommend customers to start with that then you can start implementing the first use cases like a dashboard that shows the machine status like a very simplified oee calculation like notification um, services for the maintenance team and and as i say better start with that and get to a point where you say it's not enough anymore because xyz is missing and then we can specifically care about adding xyz to our data inventory and look um, after that and uh, yeah somehow get to a point where we can define a requirement and with this modularized approach that i said in the in the first answer it's very easy to to really add more complexity to the system as we need it and not have a dead end road for a specific IT system when we started from. Okay, very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing your, your perspective there. And then if we, we look at the uh, other customer group, which is the, the machine builders, the technology providers, I guess one of the key, or let's say one of the areas that I think is very interesting, but maybe most challenging is this topic of, how to provide data to stakeholders when it doesn't necessarily benefit the, let's say, the owner or the manager of the data. So I guess the typical case would be a machine builder going to a factory and saying, can I have access to the data that's coming off my machines? It's going to be very useful for my R&D process, and I'm going to be able to build better machines and, 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 uh, and sell them to you. And the factory says, okay, great, you can build better machines. Maybe I get some minor benefit from that, but there's potentially some un, un, unforeseen risks and, and, you know, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to provide you access, right? The default answer is no, but there's certainly a lot of value in these cases to providing data, whether it's to a, a service provider, a supplier, a customer who might want to know if their product is coming off the line and so forth. So the question is, how do you enable companies to safely and securely provide access to the data to, to access that value? How do you see this evolving? Do you see, a lot of use cases among your customers where they're using Cybus to enable the sharing of data to, you know, in cases where it's not necessarily that it directly benefits the owner of the data, but maybe there's some, some monetization model or there's some way where uh, you can create a little bit of a market ecology around data. 
So I'm always a bit reluctant when somebody asks a question like this uh, in, the, in the real world, um, because I think always, if you, if you have to start about, to, to, to discuss about data, if that's a start, then something is wrong. I would say that you should always discuss about the value of the predictive maintenance. You should always discuss about the, you will never have a downtime anymore. And that's something you can sell to a customer. And when the customer buys it, and one of the notes then in the contract is, uh, by the way, that only works if you share this data specifically for that, then probably the problem is already gone. But is, if you discuss about the data in the first place, so the data is the only central element, and then you try to find an excuse why you would uh, need the data, then something is still wrong. And then I would say we are still very much in a world where nobody really has an idea. Still. Yes, I know examples where that worked. And actually, I have a very specific customer case study in mind from a German milling and drilling machine builder, one of the larger ones, who has actually done exactly that. So they have given gateways to customers and they have given them some reduction on the maintenance contract. So they actually, basically, they paid them now for, for, for getting the data. And then they collect the data, the data for their research work. They were actually quite successful with that. So they, in the end, were able to, to bring a new product family onto the market, which was 30% cheaper than all the other machines. And it was limited in their capability. So the spindle was not turning that fast and the, the machine was just smaller. But that was all based on the learnings of the actual machine usage of the customers. And they realized that although customers buy a machine that has a spindle speed of, I don't know, 20,000 RPM, nobody would ever exceed 10,000 RPM. So we, they learned that they, uh, they could just sell simpler machines. Yeah? And that was a story that actually happened by paying the customer, basically, for getting out the data. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and I, I can see why you generally be at, at you know, adverse to this, but I think it's quite interesting that a lot of the more profitable and maybe less moral or arguably less moral, but more profitable internet companies really have developed businesses where they sell services or they give away services basically to acquire data and then they, they sell data. So it's a, it's kind of an open question whether that's viable in the internet of things world. And, and if so, where there's a company uh, that a friend of mine ran back in 2013 or 14, and it, it, it went, it went uh, bankrupt or they, they closed it down. But what they were doing was kind of selling at a very low cost, these sensors into factories. And the value proposition was you can deploy the sensor, you can collect energy data and, and understand your consumption of energy, which will enable you to reduce your your energy bill. And so that's the benefit to you. The benefit to us is that we get energy data. And this was in China. And their thought process was, if we can get enough factories to deploy this and we get enough energy data, then we have a, a, a leading indicator for energy consumption. And we can either we can use this data to you know, sell this to Wall Street or sell this to, let's say, commodity traders or, or themselves become a, a trader on the energy markets and have kind of a unique data set that nobody else has which I thought was, uh, was at least a, quite an interesting concept. Obviously, it didn't in practice work out, uh, and, and maybe it was a bit too early, but do you see the potential for kind of energy broker or uh, data broker businesses to start to evolve? Let's say if you're extremely successful and enough factories kind of have controllable, uh, you know, control of their data at the right level, do you see that as a likely course uh, of uh, market development, or do you see some fairly significant barriers to that type of business model becoming successful? I think that's absolutely the, the, the future. So what, what I find most interesting is to think about who is able to provide data-based services in the future. Who's able to, pro to provide a service like the best predictive maintenance as a service thing? Yeah. And I think today it's very much restricted to the machine builders themselves. But I believe that as data becomes more easily available or accessible, there's a big potential that other customers, pure digital companies, um, can provide such services. And I think at the very least, 
because of this value that you can actually create a business based on data. Something like a data stock exchange will develop. But um, as you just draw this, draw this com comparison between um, our private data and the company data, I think there's a big differentiation to be made between consumer or B2B scenarios. Because I think exactly the transparency that we about our private data that we know we are aware of in our private life is, is exactly one of the things that motivates businesses to be much more careful about their data. So I think in order to be able to have such a data exchange market in the future, we need to bring the data producers, the factories in this case, into the driver's seat and to give them tools to control which data they, they sell. And that's exactly what this International Data Space Association is doing. So they are, they are creating even something like a digital rights model. So you can attach usage rights to data so that it's only allowed to use it for a specific purpose or you're only allowed to keep it for a number of a specific time in order to, to, to prepare something like this. So I think that is absolutely the future. And I, I, I always try to do a, a very simple comparison. On your smartphone, you have this very simple user experience that each app tells you what it wants to, to access from your private data, right? I mean, like Google Maps wants to access your location. And of course, you allow that because it's clear you cannot navigate on Google Maps without sharing your location. But if a, a, a random website or a random app that doesn't have anything to do with navigation asks me for accessing my location, then I would say no, because I, I need a clear reason to share my data for, for receiving a specific service. And that's what we try to, to copy in our software. So when you, when you have a factory and you have, I explained earlier, we have like a multi-tenant scenario where a machine builder, for example, can provide a plugin to your IoT infrastructure, and this plugin would send certain data to, to the cloud of the, of the machine builder. When you activate the plugin, it first it, it presents you which data is, uh, is transferred, so very similar to this smartphone process. And second, it also gives you transparency along the line, so you always see who receives which data, and you can immediately interrupt that. So this, I think, control and transparency beats trust. Okay, great. So I'd love to dive into a use case or a case study. But before we go there, I just wanted to quickly touch on one other topic that I think we've just briefly mentioned, which is the topic of security. So this is certainly one of the, let's say, a top three, in any case, concern or priority for just about every manufacturer. Where do you see the let's say, the status quo of the security landscape right now? And, and how does Cybus fit into that, that landscape? The topic is cybersecurity. When people talk about cybersecurity, you very often talk firewalls, intrusion detection, and so on. So um, the companies that you will usually call cybersecurity companies are companies that install something in your network which tries to monitor your network traffic and tries to warn you when something unusual is happening or tries to control with which device is allowed to communicate with uh, which other device. And if you ask me, that's super important, but I think it's not everything because that's like having a security team <laughs> in, your, uh, in your building or uh, locked doors. But as we have a, such a complex system that we discussed earlier, we have so many data sources and data things, I believe that there's an, a security layer that's hardly talked about, and that's really a pure access control layer. So, for example, I have a dashboard which shows the current status of the machine. And the dashboard is running maybe in the cloud, but maybe also locally. So then this dashboard should be able to get data from the machine, right? It needs to get data from the machine, but it never should be allowed to also control the machine. And that is a security layer that's hardly talked about. So really access control, not about who is able to talk to, to whom at all, but to, to narrow it down to the specific 
data points that are allowed to be read or the specific data points that are allowed to be written back. And that is the security layer where which we try to, to add to the system. I, I don't say replace anything, but really add to the system. Probably some more technical backgrounds, protocols like OPC UA have a strong security focus. And that's the most modern protocol in the industry. But I have never seen an OPC UA server that implements an access control scheme. Yeah? So when you have access, then you have access. When you don't have access, you don't have access. But there's no in-between you. There's no grayscale. And other protocols like the S7 protocol that you use to, to, to reprogram also over a network, um, the Siemens PLC, that has not even encryption, that has no password, it doesn't have any access control either. But still, these are the protocols that we are basing the whole industrial IoT on. And uh, so this really, in a positive sense, access control layer, so that ensures a least privileged approach. So each microservice that retrieves data from another one is only able to retrieve the minimum that it requires. That is some uh, the security notion that we add with our software to the whole system. Interesting. Yeah, and I've, I've heard other people discussing, let's say, the, the shortfalls of a firewall because you're, you're not only trying to protect the system from external bad actors, right? There are also internal actors who might have legitimate, because of their, you know, their work, legitimate access to a system, but who could also have motives that are not aligned with the company, right? So I, I can see how an access control system would at least constrain their ability to, to act within. It's, it's not only attack prevention, to be honest. Um, it's, it's also failure. I mean, uh, a system can just work wrong in order to cause damage. And it doesn't need to be evil in the first place. And also, it's also a governance issue. Because um, when you have, in the end, hundreds of systems connected to each other, then you will need to know what happens when you unplug a particular cable, now, to, to speak. Did you activate a specific sensor? Yeah? What happens? Which systems will be affected? That is a relation you need to, to keep track of. And uh, having a, a well-maintained access control list is an approach to that. Yeah, good perspective. Let's then discuss a case study. And, and let's look at it from an end-to-end perspective. So you know, from, let's say, the first conversations with uh, the customer um, about their, their challenge through the deployment, um, do you have a particular case in mind? Yeah, so I, I would um, jump again into the case of this uh, milling and drilling machine builder I mentioned earlier. It's one of the top three uh, in Germany. And they were quite early thinking about digital services, providing basically a web portal for their customers where they could see their machines, the health status of the machines, um, probably recommendations in order how to, to, to better uh, perform on the machines and order spare parts, maybe even automatically. This customer, as everybody else, implemented everything on their own in the first place. Uh, so they implemented a, I'm not even sure which cloud platform they chose, but that doesn't matter. So they, they implemented this portal. They implemented a very simple gateway they were able to deploy via VPN to their customers. And they installed, they rolled it out in the first place in their own premises because that's a, it's a company that produces on their own machines, basically. So that's, that's basically the situation where, the, where we found them or they found us. So technically, everything worked, um, of course. As I said, it's, it's technically not very hard, but they had a hard time rolling that out to customers because this was one of these black box gateway issues that didn't find much acceptance, um, especially at larger customers. That was one problem. And the second problem was this customer had uh, created a, a known department for creating these digital services. And there were a number of software developers in the department Sooner or later, they realized that the gateway is not as simple as they thought because you have to be very universal when it comes to uh, proxy scenarios as customers. You have to be efficient on deployment. You have to maintain the gateway and so on. It's security critical, as we said. 
Um, and they said, no, our core competence is not creating gateways, but our core competence must be creating the digital services. And so they were searching for a supplier with a yeah, plug and play gateway solution that also solves the acceptance problem. In this case, are you providing the entire gateway solution? Are you kind of white labeling gateways and um, installing your technology? Or are you deploying on the existing gateways that they already had deployed? What we did was pretty interesting because they have um, already created their gateway or at least the specific business logic they needed for their gateway. And uh, as most people today, um, they implement as a, this as a Docker container. And Docker is quite a quite a good uh, plug and play solution when it comes to integrating somewhere else. And we have in our software a runtime environment for third-party Docker containers because that's how we consider plugins to be most straightforward. And so it was pretty straightforward to take their existing gateway technology, integrate their specific business logic into our solution and deploy that to the end customer. And um, so then we basically provided a wrapper for product lifecycle management, updates, integrating into customer IT systems, uh, Active Directory integration of the customers, proxy integration, and so on. But we never do white labeling. So what the customer, the end customer get is a Cybus Connectware with a we call it a service. We could also call it an app, but we call it a service uh, with a service that carries the label of the machine builder. And this service can be deactivated or activated. And if you activate it, then you get presented a little dialogue that explains machine builder XYZ wants to access data from the following machines. Then, of course, you have to enter the IP addresses of the machines. And specifically, the following data will be transferred to the cloud of the manufacturer. And then it really leaves you with allow or not. And if you don't allow it, then of course it doesn't get activated, but that's a sales problem basically for the machine builder. And if you allow it, our software ensures that the OPC UA connection to the machines is set up, um, that the right data points are subscribed, that these data points are made available in the right format to the Docker container of the machine builder, that the, uh, this Docker container is running, basically. So that's a plug-and-play user experience. On the same deployment of our Cybers Connect, where you could also either install a similar service from another vendor or do something else with the same data. So in this case, and that's um, how we have this multi-tenancy, we have even situations where this machine builder could deploy their services and our software was already there because we already did another sale earlier at the same customer. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So this is really almost a sales enablement proposition for your, your customer here. What was the development time for this? So let's say from the time you started having conversations to the time this was deployed, what, what did, uh, what is a typical, maybe you could ask what was it for this situation and then what would be a typical timeline? It really depends on, on the prerequisites. They were quite good here because, um, as I said, the, the machine was already equipped with the necessary interfaces and, the, and the, also the cloud platform was already developed. So I think we, we had three to four months. Uh, we worked together with them like full time on our side, um, but just because they have a sprint planning and things develop and we have individual um, uh, reviews. But I think in, in, very, in, in a few weeks, um, you can already achieve a lot. It totally depends on, on the prerequisites. So if, if today a customer approaches us and says, here's an OPC UA server, we need a gateway solution for Azure IoT, then it's something we can, we can implement in, in very few days. If we start at, here's a machine, can you explain OPC UA and which cloud should we choose? Then, of, co of course, a more complex consulting project starts. The pure implementation is pretty straightforward because we usually don't have to customize anything. It's just configuration. Okay. So your business model, I mean, I guess it's dictated to an extent by just the maturity of the, of the market right now. But then would a typical 
solution, it would look like some upfront advisory or, or development cost, like a one-time. And then does it move to a SaaS model based on the number of uh, gateways or machines or, or facilities? Or how, how does a typical business model look like for, let's say, maybe a factory and a, uh, and a technology provider? Of course, we can we can do some uh, consulting work or system integration uh, where we really um, sell NAND days basically um, when that's required by the customer. But that's not our very business model. We have a small team of support engineers that can help here, but we are not trying to maximize um, these days. Uh, instead, if a customer really needs consulting or system integration support, we have partners. Namely, from the big ones, MHP and DXC, that are trained for our software and they are doing re really the bigger projects here. And then our um, business model is a, is a license model. And this, uh, there are two models basically. So when we sell to factories, then it's a very classic software license, a monthly subscription that scales with a number of machines and also with the, yeah the enterprise grade basically so in the smaller tiers we don't support complex user management and so on and in the larger tiers you can have high availability clustering support enterprise uh, so um, active directory integration and so on for these service providers like i just described it's more complex because usually they have they are at the beginning of defining their own business model so we have a value-based uh, selling approach here, and we usually agree on a license per deployment of the service that is uh, a ratio of, uh, of the turnover of the service provider. But that's a very individual thing because we have realized that usually these service providers, they're, just, uh, they're often at a, at a point where they discuss technology but their business case is also not defined yet. And we try to be not in the way there. Okay. Oh, that's uh, super, super interesting though, that, uh, I mean, uh, one of the things that really fascinates me around the IOT market is that the technology enables a, a tremendous amount of business model innovation, right? And, and you're now in the position of basically innovating together with your customers to figure out what makes sense for, you know, for both of you in the long term. Very good, Peter. Well, I think this has been, for me, really a fascinating conversation. Is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that you think is important to cover? Um, I, I think we, we, uh, we discussed a lot of things. I, I just, I look into my notes, but there's nothing in particular that I think we have missed. <laughs> Great. Then just maybe one last question for me, which is, what is the best way for people to reach out to you or to the team if they're interested in learning more? So just the easiest way is um, send us an email to hello at cybers.io. You can also visit our website. There's some white papers to download. Um, it's cybers.io. And we would be very happy if you would reach out to us. Um, doesn't matter if you're a factory at the beginning of your own digital endeavor or if you're a machine builder or a component supplier that wants to provide digital services. Everybody who needs a gateway to get machine data into a cloud might be potential customer so let's just talk very good well we will put that in the notes uh, hello at uh, cybers.io peter thank you so much for the time today thanks eric it was a pleasure thanks for tuning in to another edition of the industrial iot spotlight don't forget to follow us on twitter at iot1hq and to check out our database of case studies on iot1.com if you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.